thank you very much for the, for the lovely introduction um and many thanks for the invitation it's a uh, it's a great pleasure to finally be with you yeah. after after <laughs> many months of delay um so i'm gonna so um both of my my two talks uh, this weekend are going to be about problems which which didn't didn't start in combinatorics so this one's today and uh, i'll talk about a problem that started in number theory and tomorrow one that started in analysis but i hope to convince you that really these um these problems are are, are basically at heart um so they turned out to be essentially very nice combinatorial problems um and I, so i hope I have to, to explain that to you um uh, i uh, I'm going to try and go go nice and slowly so so everyone can follow. Please, please do feel free to ask questions anytime. If anything is unclear at all, if I forget to explain something, then um, I'm extremely happy to be interrupted. I'm, I'm much happier to be interrupted than not. Um, okay, so today I'm going to tell you about um, some things called Erdős covering systems. I'll um, I'll tell you I'll tell you what they are in a second. Um, so this is all, all joint work with um, with Paul Ballester, who was in Memphis for many years and now is in Oxford. Um, Bela Bolabash, I guess you all know, um, in Memphis and Cambridge. Um, and then two two young people that you may may not know um, yet, but uh, if you don't, then you will you will know them soon. Um, Julian Sazrabude um, was a student of Bela in Memphis, and then was my postdoc in Impa, and now is in Cambridge. Um, is an exceptionally exceptionally strong young mathematician. Um, and Marius Tiber, who was um, Baylor's student in Cambridge and is now is my postdoc in IMPA, also extremely strong. Um, they've done lots of lots of really great work in a, in, in a short amount of time. Um, okay, so so what is um, what is a covering system? It's nothing more than a collection of um, of arithmetic regressions, or a finite number of infinite arithmetic regressions that cover the integers. Okay, so the union is the integers. So let's just see an example. Ah, so Erdős um, introduced these in 1950, and we'll see we'll see why in a second. Um, and he then was interested in, in covering systems with distinct moduli, because obviously a, a simple way to to construct such a thing is to take say the evens and the odds, right? The evens are an arithmetic progression, the odds are an arithmetic progression, and you cover the integers, but it's not very interesting. So if you're forced to take distinct, so the modulus being the common difference, if you're forced to make the moduli distinct, suddenly it gets a bit more difficult to construct them. Um, so here's an example. So you take 0 mod 2, 0 mod 3, 1 mod 4, 5 mod 6, and 7 mod 12, that covers the integers. And it's not very obvious just looking at it, how to see that it, that it does cover. So let's, let's see um, uh, a nice way to, to, to check. And this will be useful later as well. Um, so I've written the numbers mod 12 in, in this little rectangle. So you notice that all of the, um, uh, the, so the least common multiple of the moduli is 12. So really, we're not working in the whole integers. We're really working in Z12. And um, we, can re we can write Z12 as uh, Z3 cross Z4. Um, and then we can put uh, we can put Z three cross Z four in this rectangle. So you see, the first column is things that are zero mod four, the second column is things that are one mod four, the top row are things that are, are what two mod three. Right? So by by uh, the Chinese remainder theorem or whatever, then 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 this is what you get. Okay, so now, um, what is the what is the arithmetic progression zero mod two look like? Well, it's all the even numbers. So it's the first column and the third column. So the first arithmetic progression covers those guys, right? And the second one, zero mod three, that's the bottom row. So the second one covers the rest of the bottom row. One mod four is the second column. So that knocks that out. And then we've got two numbers to, to cover and we've got two arithmetic progressions to do it with. So then we can just sort of cover trivially, five mod six covers 11 and seven mod 12 covers seven, okay? So because we had, we had two numbers left, then, then we, can just, we can just pick the, the, the shift so that we cover. Okay, so that's a sort of a, a way of constructing, um, constructing covering systems. And also a good way to think about them as, as we'll see um, in a few minutes, okay? So, are there any questions about this? Okay, so, so you remember this rectangle because we'll come back to it. 
Okay, so so why was Ed interested in these things? Well, he proved he wanted to prove the following theorem. Um, he wanted to prove that not all odd numbers are of the form two to the k plus p, where p is a prime or, or one. Um, so this was a, this uh, refuted a conjecture of the de, de Polignac and an answer question of Romanov, and the proof is is really incredibly simple and incredibly incredibly beautiful and clever. Um, so here's the, here's basically how the proof goes. So Edish observed that this is a, a covering system. So these these six arithmetic regressions cover the integers. You can check it in just the same way we just did. Okay. Um, and it was important for him that, that it didn't use mod six. That's why he didn't use the, the other one. Um, and then, okay, so it's not really obvious how this is going to help. But what he observed is, so of each of these six progressions, you can, you can find a relationship like this. So here's an example. For one mod four, you can find um, arithmetic progression, so two mod five, such that every x, such x, for every such x, five divides x minus two to the k. And so similarly, for, for say 23 mod 24, you can find a progression such that, that the corresponding prime divides x minus two to the k for every such x and every such k. Okay, so it's not really obvious why that should be the case. It follows from some theorem. Um, but, so once you find these things, well, the, you know, the primes you use are these six primes. And maybe it's not completely obvious, but if you think about it, that means that all the x's that satisfy these six, uh, these six equations, they form an arithmetic progression such that for any k, one of these six primes divides x minus two to the k, and because there's only a finite number of numbers of that form, there's an infinite number where it fails. Okay, so this, but don't, don't worry too much if you didn't follow the details of that. It's just to give an idea of this, this, this very surprising proof, this very surprising application of a covering system. You just find a little covering system and suddenly you can, you can show that uh, you, can, you can prove this, this seemingly sort of difficult theorem. Okay. Okay, so that, that was Eddie's motivation. Um, so immediately after, in, the, in this paper of 1950, immediately after giving the proof um, that we just, uh, just um, sketched, he stated the following problem. So he said, do there exist covering systems with distinct moduli with arbitrarily large minimum modulus? So all of the moduli large. Okay, so just to, to to make sure we all understand the question. So what about minimum modulus three? Well, he gave this following example. So here's a few progressions, and then here's a few more, and then even more. And then in the end, he, he, so once again, you can, you can check this by hand um, that it works. So, so this sort of not, not especially trivial um, system of progressions um, covers the integers and does not use mod two. Okay, so the smallest modulus is three. Okay, so we gave this example and said, well, okay, I, I can't see how to construct them, but it seems likely that they, they should exist. That uh, we're just maybe not clever enough. This is three years after his, um, his famous lower bound of the Ramsey numbers. So maybe he was already thinking that maybe one could do this randomly in some way. Okay, okay. So this is sort of the, the, one of our main uh, motivations. Um, so what was what was proved about this over the years? Oh, sorry. So so um, sorry. So our, our three main motivations um, uh, for this talk are going to be this this problem that I just stated. So do there exist these covering systems um, with arbitrary large moduli? A couple of years later, he um, edited wrote another paper about this. this. This paper was in Hungarian. So. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on based on Baylor's translation. Um, Edish actually gave this paper to Baylor when he was uh, when he was very young. So almost when he was the first paper he read, um, Edish gave him this 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 paper with this with this question in in Hungarian and, and asked him if he could solve any of the problems. Um, so um, so in fact, so we came to work on this problem because. Uh, because we sort of th thought this was interesting and didn't know that Edge had asked, asked this, but then Baylor remembered um, 
from whatever, 60 or 70 years earlier, or perhaps not quite that long when he gave it, but a long time ago he was, he'd already seen this paper, this question. Um, so it's, it's a very natural question, how, so how many of these things are there? Um, the word minimal here um, is just because otherwise there are infinitely many. So, so just to say, so why, how do you construct infinitely many covering systems of size two? Well, the integers themselves are a, a covering system. So then take that and then any other arithmetic progression. So if you don't have the word minimal, it's a bit silly. But once you add the word minimal, then these are, the number is finite, as I just showed. Um, and, and he asked, asked how many. Um, there's another question which perhaps looks a bit more complicated, but it's also very natural and quite sort of, um, is asking something sort of quite fundamental. So this is saying that, okay, suppose you take these, these uh, a progress, uh, sorry, uh, a covering system, distinct moduli, all moduli sufficiently large. And well, how many times do you cover? So what's, what's, the, what's the total density of these arithmetic progressions? Well, each one has density one over D, where D is the, D is the common difference. So the total sort of measure of the progressions is the sum of one over D, okay? So that can be arbitrary large, of course, right? Which is perhaps why another, another motivation for um, Erdish to think that the, the answer to his first problem is, is yes. But what they asked was, um, was okay if, if this um, this sum is bounded, so you only cover on average a bounded number of times. Um, so, is it true that the uncovered set not only exists but has has positive density, depending only on um, uh, only on c? Okay, so I'll, I'll come back to this later. This is sort of basically the 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 feel behind all of these things is you have all these progressions, and the question is how independent are they? So if the progressions are independent of each other, then you can't cover everything because each one just chops off one over D proportion and you end up chopping off just, you, you always end up leaving something. But if they're not so dependent, then, then you have some chance of covering everything. So, so the questions are really all saying, how independent are these, these progressions? Okay, we'll, we'll see that a, a bit, hopefully a bit, clearly, a bit more clearly a bit later. Okay, are there any questions at this point? I'm about to, uh, to, to go into some, some proofs in a second. Okay, if not. So we're first gonna concentrate on, on this, um, this question, which is really the, the most famous of, the, of these questions. Um, and so, as I said, Erdős managed to construct one that avoided two. Um, then, then Churchhouse came with a construction of nine. Then over the years, this, these constructions improved. Um, got to 24 by, by the time I was born. Um, and then there was a break for about 25 years until it was improved by one. It slowed down quite a lot. Um, but then Nielsen um, in this paper in um, about 10 years ago, he, um, he really sort of systematically tried to construct these things. It's a very impressive paper. Uh, this, the construction he came up with is, is exceptionally complicated. Um, and based on he really sort of pushed things as 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 hard as he could, um, and based on this, I think he 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 suggested that perhaps perhaps you can't actually construct these things. Um, so I say that the the record is slightly better. I think it's a student of Nielsen, um, a few years later, just uh, just modified things a bit. Um, okay, so let's push to forty two, which is sort of it's it's more impressive than it sounds. Um, in the other direction, so the first it's a really important paper about um, about this problem was uh, was the paper of Filoseta, Ford, Conjuging, Pomerantz, and Yu, um, and they so they they proved some results in the in the other direction. So they didn't um, they didn't answer the question, but they they answered some other questions of uh, so Graham and and Erdős and Erdős and Selfridge, um, which were sort of asking for sort of weaker versions or or, or stronger versions, depending on your perspective. Um, and they introduce a, a, a new method, and and based on this method, um, and to, um, Hoff um, in this wonderful paper in 2015 um, actually completely solved the problem. So um, so he showed that actually contrary to Edish's um, belief, these things do not exist. So every covering system with a distinct moduli has bounded minimum modulus. Okay, and the bound he he obtained was was about about 10 to the 16. This proof is is extremely clever and quite complicated, um, 
Um, so my my first real aim, because my main aim of, of the of, of the talk is to describe a proof of this theorem. So I'm not going to describe Hoff's proof, but I am going to describe a sort of a simplified version that um, that came out of of our work. Um, so the I'll I'll, I'll try to explain roughly roughly what Hoff did, and and where the the, sort of, the, the trick is that, that simplifies things a lot. Um, and I, I really want to tell you this proof because um, the method is really the so Hoff's method is is really beautiful, um, and and I think it it should be very very general. It's certainly very powerful. Um, I haven't yet managed to find the, the applications of it that 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 I feel should exist. Um, so I'm I'm attempting to to publicize this this method as much as possible, um, in in the hope that that such applications will appear. Um, okay, so how do you prove such a theorem? And again, the proof, the proof will, be, will be completely combinatorial. Okay. Um, okay, so here's first is a very rough outline and then we'll go into, go into a few more details. So, so we, we've got some, we're given some, some collection of arithmetic progressions and the idea is sort of reveal them in bunches. So the way Hoff did it was he he broke up the pri the primes into a bounded number of groups and revealed um, sort of a group at a time. Um, we'll do it in a, in a slightly different way, but so you reveal them in in some sense prime by prime, and you try to track the evolution of the uncovered set as you sort of reveal more progressions and cover cover more of the space. Um, and the key idea, so, so right, so you, you're revealing that the, the, the total measure that you cover, so if you, you sum up all the measure of all these progressions, is the sum of one over D. And that can be arbitrarily large, right? Um, so you can cover, certainly, whatever happens, you can cover almost all of the space. Um, but there's going to be a little uncovered set. And so the key idea is to define a probability measure on um, on our our, uh, right, our Zn for some n that distorts the space and and blows up so focuses on the uncovered set. So we're going to have this very very small uncovered set. We're going to have covered almost everything in the uniform measure, but we're going to distort things so that we sort of focus on the the uncovered set. And we want to do this in a way that sort of we want to minimize the distortion while maximizing the focus in some way. Um, and what particularly Hoff wanted was he wanted this set to remain sort of quasi random. And the hope is then if the set sort of looks quasi random, that when you hit it with a new arithmetic progression, you only cover the expected amount. So you only cover one over D proportion roughly of the uncovered set. So if in each step, if with each progression, you only cover one over D proportion, you can't cover everything. There's always going to be things left over. So if you can sort of keep this set looking random-like via this distortion, then you can keep this sort of uh, this independence between the um, between the progressions. And if a progression is sufficiently independent, then then you won't cover everything. Okay, so we we bound the distorted measure of the set covered. So make sure try and make sure it's sort of typical, um, and then show that the right if, if the minimum is large, then the total distorted measure removed is small. Okay, so that's the that's the very high level um, uh, view of the proof, and because of the way that that Hoff did this, um, he had a he had this, this quite sort of technical quasi randomness condition that he needed to maintain. Um, and that caused a lot of, sort of technical difficulties, and it was um, it's 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 very impressive uh, the way that he that he sort of overcame that, those. Um, what we're going to do is something sort of similar to this, but um, there's going to be a twist at some point, uh, and that's going to to make life much simpler. And then just finishing off is going to be really sort of surprisingly simple. Okay, so I'm going to basically give um, uh, a, a sort of full sketch of uh, of of the proof. Um, so again, please 
whenever there are questions, whenever things are unclear, um, whenever I'm going too fast, please, please do uh, slow me down with questions. Okay, so, um, so in order to make things a bit more combinatorial, because primes are kind of difficult to think about, right? Primes and, and numbers. So let's let's uh, let's think about a, a more sort of combinatorial or geometric setting. So we're just going to have, um, which can be slightly more general as well. We're going to have um, n sets and finite sets. We're going to just take the the sort of the, the cube made by taking their their product. Okay, so qn is this sort of n-dimensional cube. Um, and we're going to be thinking about uh, about hyperplanes. So, so to to map this back to the integers, the the sets um, the set S K is going to correspond to the prime P K. And so, a hyperplane. So these are not just any old hyperplane; these are access parallel hyperplanes. We're going to take this this product of sets where either you take the entire the entire of S I or just a single element. Okay, so this sort of special family of of hyperplanes. These hyperplanes are going to correspond to arithmetic progressions. So, if you, uh, if you're at least in the square-free case, um, I, an arithmetic progression will correspond to a hyperplane of this type. Okay, so we've got these sort of simple, these simple hyperplanes. Um, and then, what is the what is the common difference of the of the arithmetic progression? Well, that just maps to um, to this set of fixed coordinates. Okay. So each, so having distinct uh, moduli is going to correspond to having distinct sets of fixed coordinates. Okay, the fixed coordinates are just the ones which are not the whole space, they're just a, a single point. Okay. Anyway, we say that two hyperplanes are parallel if they have the same fixed set, which means they really look parallel, um, and that's going to correspond to having the same modulus. Okay, so the two arithmetic progressions with the same modulus have the same fixed set. Okay, so so using the just the Chinese remainder theorem again, um, at least in the in the square free setting, which is which is sort of a, a simplification that doesn't really matter, um, then we can map our problem about numbers into this uh, this sort of this nice sort of geometrical combinatorial setting. Okay, so now let me say the theorem. So here's our version of this theorem. So. Suppose that the, the size of the sets is growing, um, there's at least 4k when k is large. Um, so in the application, sk is going to be, the, the size of sk is going to be the prime, the kth prime. Kth prime, of course, has size about k log k. So this is easily satisfied. Okay, so in fact, that we're for the application, we only need k log k, but we can do it with, with 4k. Um, so given this sequence, so again, think of it as being the primes, there exists a constant c such that, so if we take this um, this this height this n-dimensional space, and we take um, a collection of non-parallel hyperplanes that covers it, so that's the same that's the same as saying arithmetic progressions with distinct differences. Then, one of the hyperplanes has its fixed set contained in the first c uh, element. And so what does that mean? Well, the fixed set corresponds to the common difference. So having your fixed set in one up to C means your common difference is at most the product of the first C primes. Okay. So that's what I just said. So this implies Hoff's theorem in the case of square free moduli. So if you, if you only allow your, your common differences, you don't allow them to, to be divisible by any squares. Um, and the proof is, is, is just what I said. You just set SK to be the, to the numbers one up to PK, where PK is the kth prime, and use the Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, so we're, we've, we've, tran we've translated the problem into this slightly more general geometric setting, um, and we see that it's, it's giving us something stronger. I should say that the, the, the fact that it's square free doesn't really matter. So it's, it, it, it makes everything look a bit simpler, um, but it's not, it's not a real, it's not, it's not a real, it doesn't really make a big difference. Okay, so don't don't worry too much about it. Ah, and this is also not far from best possible. So what do I mean by that? Um, I mean this bound on uh, on S K is can't be improved by much. So so just using a, a, a basically trivial um, random construction shows that you can't make it smaller than K minus a tiny bit. Um, 
somewhat interestingly, we don't know the answer when s k equals k for every k. That's just it's uh, the the counterexample just fails, and and our method also fails. So it's a nice open problem to. It's a very, very natural case where s k equals k that we that we don't know how to do. Okay. Any questions about this uh, this theorem? Okay, so we're we're trying to cover this um, this n-dimensional space with non-parallel hyperplanes. Okay, these are axis parallel hyperplanes. Okay, so what are we going to do? So here's a picture of the setting. So let's um, let's reveal the the space from dimension by dimension. So after k steps, we're going to have this uh, this space q k, which is the product of the first k uh, coordinates the first k sets. And let's think of this even as being uh, sort of the qk minus one on the x-axis or k minus one dimensional space, and then one of the dimensions, the last one we're, we're, we're sort of looking up. And let's imagine that we've revealed all of the, um, the hyperplanes that are sort of contained in qk minus one, meaning that their fixed set is contained in, in the first k, k minus one elements. So using those, we've covered a bunch of the space, they look like this. So because their fixed set is, is contained in the first k minus elements, they look in the other coordinates, like the, they fill the space in the other coordinates. Okay. So you've covered some amount of qk minus one, and then that means that for those coordinates, you've covered all of the rest. Okay, so you've covered these kind of gray, gray sets. Um, and then in the kth round, we uh, we reveal the, the hyperplanes that also use direction k. So use their, their fixed set is contained in one up to k. And they look a bit like this. So here's one of them. So this, this should really be a hyperplane. But because I can't draw in, in high dimensions, I've instead drawn an arithmetic progression. So I, I hope you'll sort of um, I don't know, be, 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 be kind and understanding of my drawing skills. Um, but OK, so we reveal a few of these. There's another one. Uh, and there's another one. And uh, no, that's it. OK, so that, that, those are the ones that are revealed in step k. And now we've uh, now to re reveal a different direction, so the one coming out of the out of the page, and we continue in in the next step. Okay. And our our aim is going to be to define this probability measure on these sets q k. So we're given a probability measure. So we so after k minus one steps, we've constructed a probability measure on q k minus one. And now, which sort of focuses on the uncovered set, and now we've we've covered some more stuff, and now we need to decide how to modify this this measure to be not on QK minus one, but on QK. Okay, so we so um, so what's the most natural way is to say, all right, let's just uh, on each sort of each fiber, so we call these these columns fiber, just spread it out evenly, so just uh, distribute it uniformly. So given given the the measure of a, of a column, just uh, on each fiber, do it do it uniformly, except we want to avoid the the covered things. So what Hoff said was basically, all right, let's just push it off the covered bits. Okay. So if you've covered if you've covered some points, give them measure measure zero, say, and 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 push that onto the rest. Okay. So that was the sort of the, basically the distortion he he used. Um, and we're going to do something very similar. But just slightly different, slightly more complicated. Okay, but it's but it's going to help us a lot um, later. Okay, so here's what uh, what we actually do. Okay, so QK is is QK minus one the x-axis cross SK. So for each x in in on the x-axis, um, let's define alpha KX to be the proportion of the fiber, this column X that we cover. Okay. So, so the first, the first column you cover nothing. The second you cover one. The third nothing, and so on. So, I managed to fail. Oh, there's, there's one guy who we covered two. But anyway, so you might cover whatever proportion. Okay, so that's what alpha k is. It's the proportion that you cover in round k. Uh, we fix a delta that will be chosen, sort of cleverly depending on the application, and define the probability measure at time k as follows. So for each x where we only cover a little bit, less than delta, 
then we just do what Hoff did. We we set we set the probability to be zero on the covered bits, and 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 distribute uniformly on the uncovered bits in the fiber. Okay. But if alpha k is, x is bigger than delta, then we're sort of distorting too much. We don't like that. We want to we want to keep the distortion to a minimum. And so what we do is just incredibly simple. We just cap the distortion by saying, all right, we're going to increase the rest of the points um, above, above uniform by as if it were delta, and then decrease on the on the, the covered bit by, by a corresponding factor. Okay, so we just sort of push as much of the measure as we can off the covered set. We don't make it zero. Okay, so there's still some measure on the on the covered set. Okay. There's no reason this should be. It should be obvious why this is helpful. Okay, this is just um, just what we do, just to, just explain that it's a, it's a it's a very simple process. So we call this the the distortion method, um, where we're sort of distorting the measure in this this iterative iterated way. Okay. Are there questions about this? Okay. Okay. So now we have the key lemma. So what does the key lemma say? So this collection of hyperplanes, and if this funny condition holds, then you do not cover. Okay, so it's a, it's a sufficient condition to say to say what we want. We we want to say that we don't cover. Here's a sufficient condition, and it's written in terms of these funny sort of second moments of these alpha k x. Remember that alpha k of x was the proportion of the fiber of x, so the column at x. That we cover in in step k, and the expectation sub k minus one means this is in the measure on q k minus one, so the measure at time k minus one. Okay, so this is a slightly funny condition. So where does it come from? Well, the proof of this lemma is actually, I mean, unbelievably simple. It's just, really just just a few lines. So we just basically write out what the so, so dk, sorry, is the is the set of points that we remove at time k, that we cover at time k. We just um, just write out what the measure of that set is, just from the definition, and we use this this very high tech inequality that the max of a minus b and zero is at most a squared over four b. Okay, so this uh, sort of very uh, elementary inequality, and and this just this inequality falls out. And now, why are we done? Well, what is the the total measure, or so the the sum over k of the final measure of the things covered at time k? Well, one thing I didn't point out that I perhaps should have done was that the measure of a, of the covered set doesn't change during this algorithm. So we, we redistribute measure across fibers, but we don't push it around between fibers. And so the final measure um, is equal to, so the sum of the final measures is equal to the sum of these P of K, B of K. But we just bounded that by this sort of second moment looking thing. And so if that's less than one, then just by the union bound, we don't cover. Okay, so this this lemma, this sort of lemma that I'm calling the key lemma, is actually sort of almost trivial. Okay, so we literally we just write down from the definition how much measure, how, what's the measure of the set that we cover. We use this this trivial inequality, and we observe by the union bound that we're done. Okay, so so we've reduced the problem to checking. So bounding the second moments of these um, these alphas. Okay. Yeah. So so it's perhaps it's a little bit like magic, and I think it sort of is like magic. Um, but uh, but right. But 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 that's what that's what happens. Okay. So we just just with with this this funny definition of pushing measure around. Um, uh, gives you this this sufficient condition for showing that you don't cover. Okay. Okay. Right. So we just have to bound the second moment of the alphas. So how do we do that? Okay. So we have to bound the second moment. So here's a bound. 
This band perhaps also looks a little bit funny. Um, uh, but okay, so perhaps I, I'll, I'll say just a few words about the proof. The proof is also, it's also sort of completely straightforward. It's not, it's not just a few lines. It takes maybe a, a page or two, but it's not a difficult page at all. So, so you, you do some kind of little induction just to show that for any set A whose fixed set is in the first K elements, then um, the, the measure of this set is, is bounded by, by this quantity. So th this just follows from a, from a very simple induction argument. And now well, we want to bound the second moment. So we're interested in pairs of hyperplanes. So A is a, a, is a hyperplane, sorry, not, not just any old set. And to bound the second moment, we need to look at pairs of hyperplanes and how much they cover. So we apply this inequality to the, uh, the intersection of two hyperplanes, two arbitrary hyperplanes. And you use the union bound, and it falls out. Okay, so there's there's a tiny bit of counting. So this this three that you see in the in the statement um, comes from it, you're counting pairs of uh, of of hyperplanes, and so uh, you're asking basically whether for each coordinate is it in the first one or is it in the second one or is it in both basically. So there's, there's some three to the three to the k comes in. Okay, so but 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 not, nothing. I mean. Nothing, nothing complicated at all. Nothing that a sort of um, uh, an undergrad student wouldn't would, would struggle with. Okay, so it's all it's all very very straightforward. Okay, I'm not I'm not hiding any any particularly clever ideas here. Okay. Um, okay, but then now we're done because so I've stated just a tiny bit, a slightly stronger version, which is what we actually get uh, with s k big and three plus epsilon times k. So what's the proof? Well, the previous lemma tells you what? That, um, so if, if your SK is bigger than, so SJ here is bigger than 3J, so let's say bigger than 4J, then you have this product of things that's one plus um, something that's like constant over J, right? Um, and, so that's going to give you something along, along the lines of, uh, uh, what am I saying? So k to some power. And we have a one over sk squared. So sk is something like k. So we have a one over k squared times some power of k. So as long as you pick the constant correctly, then the one over k squared is basically still there. And more precisely, we don't quite keep a one over k squared. We keep a k to the minus one plus a little bit. Okay, and uh, so if we're just summing from from capital C to to infinity, then because this is summable, um, if we take C large, then we can make it smaller than one. Okay, so this just drops out of the of the previous uh, the previous calculation. It's just telling us what, why do we need this uh, this 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 three plus epsilon times k bound. It's exactly to get this uh, this k to the minus one plus epsilon. Okay, to make this thing summable. Okay, but why is that? Why is that good? So we, what we wanted to bound was the sum of, come back here, from k equals one to n of this quantity, and what we've set, what we've actually bounded is the sum from c to n. So what about the first c elements? Well, if if the fixed set is not contained, if no no hyperplane, if there's, if there's no hyperplane like we want to find, then they're all zero. So they don't contribute anything. Okay. So either we find a high plane like we want, or the first C steps contribute zero. Because we don't cover anything. And that's it. Okay. So that, that's basically the full proof of um of Hoff's theorem. Are there any questions about, about any of that? No questions. Um, so it really is. So it, it really is sort of as as um, as simple as it looks, or, or actually probably simpler. Um, so we we uh, we wrote um, uh, a short expository note on this. It's maybe sort of eight pages long. Um, just just giving giving this version of the proof. Um, so I, if you're if you're interested, then I I, um, I recommend 
trying to read that. It, so that, that has all the details and it's, it's, I mean, literally the proof is, the proof is sort of just, just a few pages. Okay. Okay. So as I noted earlier, so this implies um, Hof's theorem for square free moduli. So just let SK be the first, the, be the, the, the K prime. Um, and if you want to get rid of this assumption that, that the moduli are square free, then it's not really difficult. It just requires a bit more work. So, so you would just apply this method in, in, a, in a slightly less pretty setting um, and, and, and everything works the same. Okay, so it's not, it's not, it's not a real compli complication. It's just, um, it's just some, some technical thing. Um, I shall say that this, this proof as I've, as I've stated it, uh, gives a gives a terrible bound for for um, the the minimum modulus, something like I forgot two to the two to the hundred or something crazy, um, but in, that's because we just wanted to sort of make things as simple as possible. Um, if you if you take this this sort of this flexibility, so the one of the, one of the the main benefits of this method is the flexibility it gives you in choosing the deltas. So. So that I just use one delta, but you can actually take a different delta for every step. Um, and that gives you a lot of flexibility in, um, in controlling what's happening. So by choosing um, a different delta for each step and choosing them very carefully, then uh, you can actually improve the, the bound given by, by, by Hoff's proof down to something like 600,000 or something. So we're, we're not yet very close to, to 42, but at least, um, at least that's some sort of improvement. Okay, so I only have a few minutes left, so I want to tell you just a little bit about um, about another problem. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to go go way too fast. I apologize. So here, here's the um, one of the theorems that Filoseta, Ford, Cunningham, Polymets, and, and you proved. So they showed that this um, this answered the question of um, Edish and Graham from 1980. Um, they showed that if the if the moduli lie in this sort of interval from n to to, to big O n. Um, then not only do you, do you not cover everything, but the uncovered set has basically the density you would hope. So the density you would hope means that if all of the progressions were just thrown down randomly, this is how much you would cover, right? Because each one covers a proportion one over D. They're all independent. This is how much you cover. So what this theorem is saying is that in this, if the, if the moduli in this interval, then the progressions are basically independent. Okay, so it's a very strong statement. Um, and this motivated them to ask this question that, that all right, so, so maybe this is true in this more general setting for any, just if the, if the moduli are large, um, if, if, the, if the, the sum of one over D is bounded, then you would expect maybe to, to be able to cover, to, to, to have an uncovered set of size E to the minus C, right? So, so basically this, this product of one minus one over D. Um, and this this was a, was one of the first our, our sort of first motivations for working on the problem, for working in this area was to was try and solve this problem, and and we were sort of we were trying to prove it was true. Um, it seems it sort of feels very likely to be true. So the the previous work is is pushing you to to prove that it's true, um, but actually it turns out that it's false, and it's false in, in an incredibly strong sense. It's false even with c equal one. So sort of somewhat shockingly, um, you can find a set of progressions with sort of large distinct moduli whose sum of the reciprocals is so small you, you can't even cover, but you can almost cover. So you can cover sort of extremely efficiently with this set of progressions. So you waste only an, sort of an arbitrarily small amount of, um, of overlap. Okay. You find these progressions that are, that are almost disjoint. So it should be sort of extremely surprising. Um, and and the uh, so there's something about the the construction which is also quite simple. Um, so you take a bunch of sets of primes, each one with the properties sort of the sum of the reciprocals is is some large constant, and then you so you take these groups and and the idea is that um, is that you take the product the product of all the previous one of all the previous groups times one of the new new primes. So at each at each step, um, and this allows you to, to to cover and then just just choose them greedily. Okay. okay, so if that's the, the answer is somewhat disappointingly no, then what's the correct positive theorem for this question? Um, and so, oh, right, so 
here it is. Um, so I'm, I'm almost on my last slide, so I'll perhaps I'll take a couple of minutes to, to, to look at this. So the conclusion is that if you have um, a, a, a collection of arithmetic regressions with distinct moduli, all sufficiently large, and you have this condition, not that sum of one over D is bounded, but the sum of this function chi of D over D is bounded, then the density, density of an uncovered set is what you expect. Okay, so we have to take a slightly stronger condition, not take it so just by, by this, this chi you see is a little bit bigger than one. And this slightly stronger condition allows you to deduce what you want. Okay, so this is this theorem is false if chi of d is one, but it's true for this chi of d, something a bit bigger than one. Okay, so you might look at this and say, okay, well, fine, they added something, but maybe they added a lot. Maybe they added just way too much to make it work. But actually, um, this is sort of almost correct. So, um, so if you replace this, this, this one plus log p to the four over p by one plus constant over p, then it's false. Okay, then we, we can come up with a, we came up with a construction sort of based on the, the previous construction, but a bit more complicated, which, um, which shows that, that this, is, this is sort of, is, is completely false if, um, uh, if, you, if you make chi a little bit smaller. Um, and this, this four in the log, p, the log p to the four over p, this is the same four as we saw earlier in the, in the earlier theorem. Okay, so it comes from the fact that when we're doing the counting, then we get, we sort of have to count, count this, we get this factor of three to the k, and so this four is really a three plus epsilon, it's got to, it's got to beat that factor, okay? So, so the, the, so the error in the previous, previous theorem also appears, appears here in this, in this log p to the four. So perhaps this, perhaps this shouldn't be there, perhaps the, the correct answer is really one plus um, something going to infinity over p. Uh, it'll be interesting to prove that. Um, okay, so I have one minute left, so I can tell you just um, some other other very quick consequences. So there's a bunch of other questions people asked over the decades about these things, and and our method is is sufficiently flexible to prove some of them. So we could prove this conjecture of Schinzel that in a covering system one moduli divides another. Um, but we couldn't quite solve this um, this problem of Edgerton Selfridge, which is uh, strictly stronger than than Schinzel's conjecture. Um, asks if there's a covering system with all moduli distinct and odd. Um, so uh, Hoffen on Nielsen uh, used Hoff's method to prove this. Uh, this to sort of, it looks like it's almost there. So they show that uh, you always have a modulus that's ruled by two or three. Um, we get something a little bit stronger, sort of as an immediate consequence of our method. Um, and then this uh, this this. Uh, version took a, took, took a fair bit of extra extra work. So if you in the in the square free setting, then it's then it's true. But it seems our method is not strong enough to prove the the full edge of selfridge uh, to, to solve the full edge of selfridge problem. And it's not even really clear if it's if it should be true or not. Um, uh, okay, thanks very much for your attention.